Hello and welcome. You're watching Gravitas. I'm Molly Gambhir. Let's get started. Our top story tonight is about sanctions and the West's hypocrisy. China is reselling Russian gas to Europe. In fact, Europe is buying Russian gas at exorbitant rates. What happened to the West sanctions, you may wonder? And what is the US doing? It likes to preach to the world, but clearly not to Europe. It likes to lecture India but Europe is clearly an exception. We focus on this over the next few minutes. When Putin invaded Ukraine, the West had two options, either intervene directly or use economic sanctions. The West decided on the latter. But historically, sanctions have never been successful. Do you know why? Because they are never watertight. Someone or the other is always diluting them. And case in point is Europe. Vladimir Putin has successfully weaponized gas supplies to Europe. And last week, he shut off the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. It is the biggest gas pipeline in Europe. So naturally, countries like Germany are spooked. In fact, even before the shutdown, their condition was precarious. Russia had gradually reduced the gas supplies, first to 40% of the total capacity and then to 20%. So what did Europe do? It looked for alternative sources ahead of winter. And guess where they found that? China. Beijing is the largest importer of liquefied natural gas. In 2021, it bought around 109.5 billion cubic meters. This year, imports were up 60%. And a lot of that came from Russia. In the first half of 2022, China bought gas worth $2.16 billion from Russia. Before the war, Russia was China's sixth largest supplier and now the fourth largest. But after buying up all this gas, China realized it had a problem. Nobody was using it. You see, their economy was crippled by the zero COVID lockdowns in the first half of this year. The restrictions severely impacted factories, restaurants. There were no public events. So all this LNG had to be diverted somewhere else. Enter Europe. European companies started buying gas from Chinese refineries. Their LNG imports are up almost 60% and out of this, 7% was Russian gas. In other words, they were laundering it. Let me explain how this trade works. Russia first sold liquefied natural gas to China, but China had no use for it. So they resold this Russian gas to Europe. That too at three or four times the normal rates. So much for decoupling from Russia. The fact is, Europe is still importing gas from Russia. But the only difference is they are not doing it directly. They are doing it via China. And this is not the first time. Previously as well, we have received such reports. First about ghost ships. Some of you may remember this trend. Many Russian oil tankers disappeared off the radar after leaving the port, their route was not published. It only said destination unknown. Many Iranian and Venezuelan tankers regularly do this. It is a common trick to evade sanctions. They don't sail 
to the west. Instead, they offload their cargo onto bigger tankers at sea. They mix the Russian oil with other crude products. So now you cannot identify it. In March, the number of such ghost ships surged 600%. They were smuggling almost 1.5 million barrels of oil daily. The U.S. is also guilty of such laundering. Two weeks after the war, they imposed a ban on Russian oil. But just how effective is that ban? According to reports, not much. Russian crude is still used by refineries in China and India. Many of these refineries still export to the U.S. Do you see the problem here? America may not be importing Russian oil directly, but they are buying the same product from elsewhere, basically diluting their own sanctions. So what does this say about the West's resolve? It's based on convenience. Just think about it. Europe talks about shutting down Putin's war machine, yet they are buying Russian gas from China. The US talks about crippling Russia's economy, yet they are buying Russian oil from other refineries. Now, compare that to their attitude towards India. All those lectures, the warnings, the threats. Meanwhile, the West itself is diluting its own sanctions. Let me show you some numbers here. In the first six months of the war, Russia raked in $158 billion from energy sales. $158 billion. And these are the major buyers. The European Union, 47%. China, 24%. Remaining G7 and NATO countries, 13%. And India, just 6%. Despite the increase in imports, India's share remains low, just 6%, as compared to Europe's, 47%. So the bottom line here is, if anybody is funding Putin's war, it is Europe. And yet, they question India. And now, there is a new proposal, a price cap on Russian oil. The G7 foreign ministers have agreed to it, and they want both India and China to sign on as well. What does India have to say? Indian officials say they will study the proposal. At the same time, they have refused to be pressured by so-called moral arguments. Listen in to what the petroleum minister had to say. I have a moral duty to my consumer. Do I, as a democratically elected government, want a situation where the petrol pump runs dry? Look at what's happening in countries around India. He has a point. If Europe can violate its own sanctions to buy Russian gas, then surely India can look out for the best deals. But finding the right deal is just one part of the problem. Equally important is how to pay for it. Most of the global trade is done in one currency, the US dollar. But Russia and China are looking to break the dollar's dominance. They want to de-dollarize their economies. How exactly does that work? The first step is usually trade. Right now, all imports and exports are priced in dollars. Oil, gas, cars, clothes, each and every product product is pegged to the US dollar. Russia and China are hoping to change that. They want to trade in their own currencies, the yuan and the ruble. Yesterday, Gazprom and its Chinese partners decided to move to rubles and yuan in 50-50 split when paying for Russian gas supply. I would add that short-sighted actions have spurred global inflation. It has already surpassed records that have been set many years ago in various countries. As expected, Russia, uh, as expected, gas is the first target. In 2019, China had signed a 30-year gas deal with Russia. Shipments will reach 15 billion cubic meters by the end of this year. Until now, this trade was conducted in dollars, but not anymore. Gazprom will now receive payments in local currencies, 50% in yuan, 50% in rubles. And this is what we call de-dollarization. But the question is, how does it benefit Russia and China? You see, the dollar's domination indirectly means America's domination. It gives the U.S. a lot of influence over other economies through sanctions, through interest hikes, through monetary tightening. De-dollarization can prevent that. It can reduce America's influence over the global economy, 
Russia has been doing that since 2014. Their dollar-denominated assets amount to just 16%. In 2013, 95% of their trade with BRICS countries was done via dollars, and now less than 10%. So Russia has consciously made the effort to shun the US dollar and China is doing the same. They have created a digital currency called EUR. They also have renminbi trading centers in Hong Kong, Singapore, Europe. You can see why it's a desirable prospect. The current oil boom is draining the forex reserves of, of most countries. Governments are dipping into their reserves to import oil. De-dollarization can prevent that. And it's not just Russia and China, even India is doing this. Indian companies are using Asian currencies to buy Russian coal. In June, 44% of the trade was done via other currencies. For India, this is purely financial. It's about securing the best deals. But for China and Russia, it is political. It's about challenging the US-led world order. China and Russia are looking to further integrate their economies. In June, yuan ruble trade rose to a six-month high. Spot trading was worth around $48 billion. The question is, will it be enough to displace the dollar? Right now, the answer is no. The dollar's dominance dates back to the 1970s. That's when the U.S. struck an oil deal with Saudi Arabia. The kingdom agreed that oil would be priced in dollars. And that is key to the dollar's preeminence. It has full convertibility. It is backed by the American economy and military and is deeply integrated with the world economy. Let me give you some numbers here. 60% of all reserves held by central banks are in dollars. 70% of all trade is done in dollars. Changing that will be a long process. China and Russia alone cannot do this, which is why they are looking to create a block of like-minded countries, like the BRICS. China is eager to expand the BRICS to include more developing countries like Argentina, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Together, these countries have a lot of clout. They could challenge the dollar's dominance. But how should India see this campaign? Well. Trading in local currencies benefits India as well. Recently, the Reserve Bank of India permitted trade payments in the Indian rupee. There are also talks of a rupee-ruble trade. All of this would reduce the pressure on India's forex reserves. It would also prop up the rupee. But what about the political fallout then? Challenging the dollar is like challenging America. It also means buying into China's campaign. Remember, Beijing wants to use the financial system to dominate politically. So India's choices must be weighed carefully. And our next story is from Uzbekistan. Next week, it is scheduled to host a crucial summit, a summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Council. It will take place in the city of Samarkand with over eight world leaders in attendance. They will be meeting for a period of two days and discuss issues of global significance. And tonight I want to talk about two of the attendees, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping. The two are expected to meet on the sidelines of this summit. What can we expect from this meeting? What kind of optics will be playing out? And what dividends should we look forward to? Over the next three minutes, We'll break this down and discuss. First things first, this will be the first face-to-face -face meeting between the two leaders since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It would also be Xi Jinping's first overseas trip since the Wuhan virus pandemic and Vladimir Putin's third foreign visit since the war started. So the expectations are naturally running high for this summit. Both Russian and Chinese diplomats are actively preparing for it. And speaking to a state news agency, Russia's envoy to Beijing said, I'm quoting now, this summit promises to be interesting because it will be the first full-fledged summit since the pandemic. We are planning a serious meeting of our leaders with a detailed agenda, which we are now, in fact, working on with our Chinese partners. The Chinese side has refused to divulge any details, but it is laying the groundwork for this summit last Wednesday. 
Li Zhangshu, the chairman of the Chinese parliament and the number three in command, visited the Russian city of Vladivostok. By doing so, he became the highest ranking official to leave China since 2020. And what did he go to Vladivostok for? To attend the 7th Eastern Economic Forum. And reports say he also held a bilateral meeting with Vladimir Putin, perhaps to lay the groundwork for his meeting with Xi Jinping. Remember, the two presidents last met in February, weeks before the Kremlin sent troops into Ukraine. They signed an agreement to strengthen ties, pledging that their bilateral ties would, quote unquote, have no limits. And since then, China has carefully supported Russia's campaign in Ukraine, and tacitly so. But it has also sought to appear neutral and avoid repercussions like Western sanctions on bilateral trade and business. But in the run-up to this meeting, the two sides have become more vocal about their partnership. Case in point being the joint military drills that were held earlier this week in Russia's Far East. They involved troops mostly from China and a few other countries. And analysts say Russia wanted these war games to project its military might ahead of the meeting. Do these drills mean Moscow and Beijing plan to forge a military alliance? No one knows. However, in the past, Putin has often said that such a prospect cannot be ruled out. For instance, in October 2020, at a conference of foreign policy experts, Putin had said, and I'm quoting, China and Russia don't need a military union, but theoretically it is quite possible to imagine it. Now, has the time come to turn this imagination into reality? We shall find out in exactly eight days. On the 15th of September, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping will be meeting and chalking out the future of their alliance. This story is still developing and we will be monitoring the developments closely. On to the UK now. Liz Truss has become the new Prime Minister. Her first task was appointing a new cabinet, one that has made history in the country. All four great offices of state no longer have white men. And this move is part of the diversity pushed by the Tories to appeal to more voters. So who are these new faces and what is the cabinet's India Connect? Our next report telling you all about these cabinet members. In Britain, history is being made. For the first time, no white man is occupying the great offices of state. It's an extensive reshuffle with 15 new faces. The first is Kwasi Kwarteng. He has been appointed chancellor replacing Nadim Zahawi. Kwarteng's parents came to Britain from Ghana in the 1960s. He became an MP in 2010. This was the same year Truss became an MP too. And that's not all that the two share. They are also committed to free market economics. In 2021, he became the first black conservative cabinet minister. Now he will serve as the first black chancellor of the Exchequer. The second is James Cleverly. Cleverly has become the UK's first black foreign secretary. As a mixed race child, James Cleverly has often talked about being bullied. He says the party needs to do more to attract black voters. He was Conservative Party chairman under Theresa May. But in 2020, he was demoted by Boris Johnson. Cleverly has been the Education Secretary since July. But he was also a minister in the Foreign Office when Russia invaded Ukraine. This brings us to the Indian Connect. Suella Braverman, she is the new Home Secretary of Britain. For the 47-year-old, it is a fresh start. The London-born barrister is of Tamil and Goan heritage. She takes over the frontline role from the fellow Indian origin Brexiteer Preeti Patel. So what are the issues that she needs to tackle immediately? The first is immigration. It is an issue that has been considered to be close to Braverman's heart. When she arrived in Parliament in 2015, it was the first thing she talked about. Her father's journey to the UK from Kenya, all in the search for a new life. 
So obviously many expected her to be soft on the issue of immigration. But her comments suggest otherwise. Many suggest she will be even tougher on migration than Preeti Patel. Braverman will also be dealing with a record number of asylum seekers and a crisis of confidence in the police. How she deals with that remains to be seen. But that's just one part of the Indian Connect here. The other one is 55-year-old Alok Sharma. The COP26 president stays in his climate post in the Trust Cabinet. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Let me ask you a question now. What does it take for a story to make an impact? Is it the magnitude, the visuals, the number of people affected, or the way it is told? Well, if you ask me, the answer is none of the above. Have a look at Bengaluru, for example. It is witnessing floods. 13 million people have been affected. The visuals are scary, to say the least. And the media has been talking about it for days now. People on social media have also been strongly reacting. But the Bengaluru floods only became a big story when the rich started bearing the brunt. People woke up to the scale of this disaster when uber luxurious houses started getting flooded. Some of them reportedly costing upwards of 10 crore rupees. Bengaluru floods became a big story then when visuals like these started emerging. The story got bigger still when a startup CEO tweeted saying that he too was affected. A startup CEO, he posted this video. He said his family and pet had to be evacuated on a tractor. Quote unquote, things are bad, he said. And because this verdict was coming from someone of a certain stature, people nodded along. Things must be really bad, they agreed. Do you get my point here? In India, a story becomes big when the rich are affected. Like I was telling you, like we have been telling you, and like we were telling you yesterday, Bengaluru's floods, they're not climate change stories. The real villain here is poor urban planning. And this is an old story. It's a story of encroachment. It's a story of shrinking drains and of unsustainable urbanization. Let me first show you what India's Silicon Valley looks like right now. Water levels have dropped in many parts, but there is still widespread water logging. The traffic flow is slowly returning to normal, but power lines remain disrupted in several areas. Same with water supplies. Also, the city's lakes continue to overflow. Again, this happens every year. Bengaluru gets flooded every year. Sure, the rainfall this time is record-breaking. The ordeal is tougher than usual, but... Would the story have exploded the way it has? Would so many people be talking about Bengaluru had only the poor been affected? Would CEOs even have tweeted about it? Like we've been saying, this is not a new story. In 2017, a letter was written to the then Chief Minister Siddharamaiah. It read, Dear Sir, Bengaluru has reached the stage of a dying city environmentally. Real estate developers have thrown planning norms to the wind. Bengaluru witnessed floods in 2019, in 2020, also in 2021. As the rainy season approached this year, the city's civic body warned that there are 209 spots that are vulnerable to flooding. Despite all the history and the warnings, it took hue and cry from the tech sector and from the tech CEOs for the story to get the needed attention, for, the, for authorities to uh, swing into action the way that they have. 1,500 crores now being set aside to drain water out of Bengaluru and 300 crores have been allocated to remove encroachment. Bengaluru floods, not the only recent example of an issue becoming big because the rich were impacted. India is currently also talking about road safety. Some of you may be able to guess why. On the 4th of September, a former chairman of Tata Sons was killed in a road accident. I'm talking about Cyrus Mystery, Mystery's car. 
rammed and dashed on a parapet bridge. He died on a national highway in Maharashtra. Days later, India is looking to tighten the road safety rules. Those in the back seat of a car will now be mandated to wear a seat belt. Defaulters will be penalized. Also, cars across categories will need to come with airbags. You know, every year, thousands of people die on Indian roads. There were over 400,000 road accidents in 2021. Over 155,000 people died. Every year, when the NCRB or the National Crime Records Bureau numbers are realized, the media makes it a point to highlight the number of road accidents. We talk about road safety, about negligent driving, speeding. Sadly, nothing changes really. But the deaths of one industrialist starts changing things. Does this mean an average person's problem is not a problem? Do the poor not deserve safer roads? Let me take you back to 2018. Indian violinist Bala Bhaskar and his two-year-old daughter were killed in a car crash. The family was returning from a visit to a temple. The car hit a tree on the outskirts of Tiruvanthapuram. Bala Bhaskar was on the front seat with his daughter. The two-year-old died on the spot. And guess what happened next? Within months, the state's commission for protection of child rights wrote to the motor vehicle department. It was told to ensure that children below 13 travel in the rear seat. So do you see the pattern here? Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? Bengaluru floods becoming a story, a big story when the rich got affected. India's road safety becoming a priority issue when an industrialist dies in a road accident and it takes the death of a celebrity child to raise questions about what is the most appropriate seat for a child in a car. I've started off by asking you a question, what does it take for a story to make an impact? I guess you have the answer now and let's hope this changes soon. For over a month now, we have repeatedly spoken about the fear of a nuclear calamity in Europe. And the reason for this is the situation in the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Most of you are familiar with that name. The nuclear plant is Europe's biggest. It is located in Ukraine, but currently it is under Russian occupation. Recently, satellite images captured smoke coming out of that plant. The situation in Zaporizhia is quote unquote unsustainable. That's the word from the UN nuclear watchdog. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, visited the nuclear plant and it has now issued a report. Is there reason to be concerned? What exactly does an unsustainable situation mean? We break down the key takeaways from that report. Take a look. This is Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The Zaporizhia nuclear plant is located in Ukraine, but it is currently under Russian occupation. It has been making headlines for one reason, the fear of a nuclear accident. The only way to prevent that is to get the plant out of the line of fire. But how? The United Nations Nuclear Agency has a plan. The IAEA says there is a need to create an immediate nuclear safety zone. Officials from the International Atomic Energy Agency recently visited Zaporizhia. What they saw has now been penned down in a nearly 50-page report. IAEA inspectors say they found Russian troops at the plant. There were also equipment and Russian military vehicles. A turbine lubrication oil tank was found to be damaged. So are roofs of various buildings and also a building housing fresh nuclear fuel. Russia has always been militarizing the nuclear plant, but the IAEA did not point fingers at either Russia or Ukraine. Its chief, Rafael Grossi, briefed the United Nations Security Council about the findings. The physical uh, attack, wittingly or unwittingly, uh, the hits that this facility has uh, received and that I could personally see and uh, assess together with my experts is simply um, uh, unacceptable. We are playing with fire and something very, very catastrophic could take place. Not to engage the UN nuclear agency has given out recommendations. First, 
shelling on site and in the vicinity of the plant should be stopped immediately. The parties involved need to create a security protection zone around the Zaporizhia plant. Two, the physical protection system should be operated as designed and licensed. Recommendation number three, appropriate work environment should be re-established. The IAEA says that the Ukrainian staff operating the plant are under high stress and pressure. The situation IAEA fears is not sustainable and could lead to increased human errors, even nuclear accidents. There are seven recommendations in total and the messaging is clear. A specific recommendation in my report that the operator should be allowed to return to its clear and routine line of responsibilities and authorities at an appropriate work environment must be re-established, including with proper family support for the staff. The United Nations has put the ball in the coat of Russia and Ukraine. The two countries have been asked to agree to a demilitarized zone around the Zaporizhia plant. Ukraine is considering shutting down the plant altogether. Should the proposition if the contents of this proposal is to demilitarize the territory of the nuclear power plant, and this is logical because it was the Russian military presence that put the Zaporizhia station on the brink of a radiation disaster, then we can support such a demilitarized protection zone. What does Russia have to say? The IAEA is a very responsible organization and its leader is a very professional person. They are obviously under pressure from countries where they work, including the United States, European countries. They can't say directly that the shelling is coming from Ukrainian territory. But it's obvious. We control the station. Our servicemen are there. We're shooting at ourselves, are we? It's utter nonsense. There is no other way to describe it. You heard that from the horse's mouth. Clearly, there is no consensus on the way forward with regards to the Zaporizhia power plant. And this only adds to the growing risk of a nuclear calamity. And if you are an Apple fan, tonight is important for you. The new iPhone is being unveiled later, iPhone 14. Now, the rumor mills have been buzzing. Every tech reporter has a different take on what the new model may, will have or could have. Maybe a faster processor, a better camera, or maybe a new design. Let me start with what we know. The new iPhone will reportedly have upgraded chips. The A16 Bionic chip for Pro and Pro Max and the A15 Bionic chip for the Max. The camera is also better. The speculation is they have introduced a new telephoto lens plus satellite connectivity. You can send emergency texts even without having a network. Now remember, these are rumors. Apple is very guarded about their new products. We will know the exact details only when they are unveiled. And having said that, we must address the elephant in the room. Has the iPhone lost its innovative edge? A few years ago, Apple launches were important industry events. They set the standard for other companies. The new features almost seemed like magic. But now that magic is missing. Let me give you one example. Reports say Apple is bringing back the battery percentage meter in the new iPhone. It basically tells you the percentage of charge remaining. I know what most of you are wondering, a battery reader? Most basic smartphones already have that feature. And why is Apple doing that now? Well, older iPhones had that feature, but it was taken out in subsequent models. My point is simply, do these even count as upgrades? The same screen size, the same design, the same interface. Where is the innovation? 15 years ago, that was not the case. In 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone. It was almost like an alien device. There was no keypad, no clunky frame. It was one button and one screen. And even today, most smartphones use that same design. Like I said, Apple sent the, set the benchmark. Even phone cameras. Do you remember phone cameras from the late 2000s? You could barely see anything on the screen. Apple changed that as well. They gave powerful cameras in their smartphones. 
but recently things have stagnated. The model numbers keep changing, the price keeps increasing, but you are not exactly getting, get, getting anything extra on your phone. But the question is why? Is Apple going through a rough patch? Well, far from it. Apple is among the most successful companies in the world. It was the first to reach $3 trillion market capitalization. Their revenue keeps increasing. Last year, their third quarter revenue was $81 billion. This year, $83 billion. So money is not the problem, clearly. So what is? In one word, culture. Under Steve Jobs, Apple was not just a tech company. It was an innovation company. But today's Apple has changed. It is not focused on enchanting the customer. It is focused on retaining the customer. That is the key to Apple's strategy. If they want to sell more iPhones, customers must upgrade. Loyalty is key to their success. And to achieve that, Apple has done some shady stuff. Multiple countries have fined Apple for slowing down their iPhones. The idea here is simple. If the phone slows down, people will be forced to upgrade, which means more sales for Apple. It is a shrewd business tactic. But unfortunately for Apple, it's also illegal. A much better option is to rediscover the magic, innovate to attract new customers, which means creating new and meaningful features. Just think about it. iPhone's touch screen in 2007 was not just new, it was a problem solver. It made typing and browsing a lot easier. Same with the home button, one click, and you are back to where you started. That is the idea of innovation, not just a new feature, but a feature that solves a problem. And when was the last time Apple did that? Yes, the phones are faster, the cameras could be better, but other companies are doing that as well. There is nothing unique about a faster processor. And Apple is not the first company to go through this phase. The lack of innovation has killed many brands. Blackberry and Nokia come to mind. To avoid that, Apple must take a crucial decision. Do they want to sell status symbols or do they want to solve problems? The first iPhone in 2007 was not a luxury or a status symbol. It was a unique piece of technology. And maybe Apple needs to channel that innovative spirit. Our next story is about the Iran nuclear agreement. It's been in the making for years. But as of September 2022, it is still being negotiated. And why is that? Because Iran has highlighted four new issues that it would like to be addressed. Our correspondent Jory Cohen decoding them in our next report. Iran's government spokesperson Ali Bahadori Jaromi outlined four topics that it would like to see in the agreement. These relate to U.S. assurances that a new deal will last, U.N. monitoring and two points on sanctions relief. Meanwhile, Mossad chief David Barnett visited Washington in an attempt to highlight Israel's two key concerns and stop the current deal from being signed. Israel is opposed to sanctions relief. And the sunset clause for lifting restrictions on Iran's nuclear program when the deal expires. U.S. Ambassador to Israel Tom Niders welcomed Barnett's visit and engagement with Israel on Iran. At the same time, Prime Minister Lapid visited the 140th Squadron at Nevatim Air Base in the south of the country, which houses Israel's F-35 fighter jets in an apparent message to Iran. Israel says intelligence shows Iran is seeking a nuclear bomb. Iran says its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes. According to the UN's nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, Iran has been enriching uranium well above levels necessary for nuclear energy. With Mossad's chief David Barnet in Washington this week, as well as Israel's president Isaac Herzog in Germany, addressing what Israel sees as the dangers in the current nuclear deal, it remains to be seen what a final deal would look like if one can be reached. This is Jody Cohen for We On World Is One.
And our next story is about Netflix. The world's biggest online streaming platform is facing flack from Gulf nations. Why? For promoting homosexuality. At least six Gulf countries have warned Netflix that its content promotes same-sex relationships and is thus in violation of Islamic values. Which countries are these? Our next report telling you more. Netflix has landed itself in trouble. It is facing the ire of the Arab world. Why? Due to its content. You see, in recent years, the streaming platform has been strongly promoting LGBTQ rights. A lot of its movies and dramas now include same-sex characters. Like the controversial French film Cuties, which depicts the love story of two pre-adolescent girls. Or the animated show Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous, in which two teenage girls are shown kissing. Both the film and the show have upset Gulf countries. The nations say they contradict Islamic values and promote homosexuality in children. So they've issued a stern warning to Netflix, asking the platform to adjust their sensitivities. The warning comes shortly after Saudi State TV featured a detailed report on the film Cuties with a caption that accused Netflix of being a cinematic cover for immoral messages that threaten the healthy upbringing of children. In another report, it accused Netflix of promoting child homosexuality. How many nations have warned Netflix? A total of six. Namely Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Together they formed the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC. A statement issued by the GCC office reads, The content contradicts Islamic and societal values. Regional authorities will follow up on the platform's compliance with the directives. And in the event that the infringing content continues to be broadcast, necessary legal measures will be taken. The statement is striking. But it's not the first time Gulf nations have been found fuming over Western content. In April, Saudi Arabia asked Disney to cut LGBTQ references from the Marvel film Doctor Strange. In June, UAE banned the animated Disney film Lightyear for containing a lesbian kiss. And it's not just films that are subjected to this censorship. In June, Saudi Arabia even seized rainbow-colored toys and clothing from stores in Riyadh as part of a crackdown on homosexuality. A way of life which seems to have no place in the Arab world. Bureau Report, we on, world is one. Let's now tell you what else made news around the world. Time now for Gravitas Global Headlines. Vladimir Putin claims the grain leaving Ukrainian ports is mostly reaching Europe instead of developing nations. The Russian president questions the merits of the deal. Albania severs diplomatic ties with Iran, orders Iranian diplomats and embassy staff to leave within 24 hours, blames Iran was behind a cyber attack on the country in July. Brazil accuses Apple of discriminatory practices, barring the US tech giant from selling iPhones without a charger in Brazil, and imposing a fine of more than $2 million over the issue. A Dutch city becomes the world's first to ban meat ads in public spaces in a bid to cut the consumption after meat was found to contribute to the climate crisis. The death toll from a strong earthquake that struck southwest China rises to 74 as thousands were evacuated into temporary shelters as heavy rains threatened to cause more landslides. Firefighters in Hemet, California are battling a rapidly moving wildfire. As of now, at least two people have been killed. The blaze, dubbed the Fairview Fire, has so far spread to around 2,000 acres. Over 700 children have died across Somalia nutrition centers, according to the UN Children's Agency. A day after the global body warned that parts of the country will be hit by famine in the coming months.
The death toll from a massive fire at a karaoke bar in Vietnam's Ho Chi Minh City rises to 32. The cause of the blaze that left customers and staff members trapped is not yet known. Investigation is underway. English Premier League giants Chelsea have sacked head coach Thomas Tuchel hours after a shock Champions League defeat against Dinamo Zagreb. Brighton manager Graham Potter has emerged as the frontrunner for the coveted post. Mercurial Australian Nick Kyrgios lost a five-set thriller in the quarterfinals of the US Open against Russia's Karin Kachanov. Kyrgyz smashed two rackets in frustration after the defeat. Gachanov will now clash with Kasper Ruud in the semis. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas. Thanks very much for watching. Leaving you with Gravitas Images. <laughs>